I wanted a way to destructively test part strength, so I created my own version of an automatic hammering machine. It's fun and it's more useful than you might think. Another channel on YouTube I enjoy watching is Fireball Tool, and if I did more metal work, I'd definitely be a customer of theirs. And in a recent video, I saw a testing apparatus that I just had to adapt for 3D printing. Fireball Tool had a new vice called the Hardtail, and I have to say it looks like a really nice piece of kit. And to prove this, they made an extensive testing video, covering the product development and comparing it to leading competitors with a series of destructive tests. What really caught my eye was this mechanical hammering machine, designed to push each test vice to its limit. Once powered up, it was completely automated, lifting the hammer clear, rotating it at the top of the movement until it swiveled down and smashed into the test piece. The beauty here is that this system is entirely repeatable, whereas the force will naturally vary as you bash something by hand, particularly as you get tired. This machine will deliver the same blow in the same place over and over, allowing you to count the amount of blows until something fails, and this means you can compare the impact strength of various objects. For me, what's really clever is the lifting mechanism. If you were to take something heavy like a mallet and try and rotate it only from the end of the handle, you would require a lot of torque to be able to do so. But if we add a secondary lifting point, this job becomes much easier, and it also means the mallet is free to swivel when delivering the blow because it's decoupled from the lifter. If we pause the original video, we can see this in action, with a lifting support bar being separate to where the mallet handle rotates. This reduces the strain on the motor for rotating the mallet into position, and when it reaches the top, it simply swivels, decoupled from the rest of the machine, reducing stress on the whole mechanism. I've wanted to do some strength and impact testing for a while, but I just didn't have any suitable tools for the job. So in this video, I present to you my free and open source version that you can also make at home. Let's start with the design and I'm not going to spend long explaining it. The primary reason I'm showing it here is to explain that it's open source. If you're using Onshape, you can make your own copy and remix as necessary. If you're not, you can still access this document without signing in. Right click on any individual part and select export and select whatever format suits your CAD best. You can also right click on the Hammer Tester tab, again click on export, with the difference being that doing it this way will export all of the parts already in their position. When it comes to slicing and printing, unfortunately you're going to need a printer bed that's 300 by 300 to accommodate the largest frame pieces. Beyond that, we want these parts to be strong, so I would recommend upping the wall loops as well as the infill density. There are some sections underneath that have been blanked off so they'll print as a bridge and without support. However, if you want the cleanest surface possible, you can use paint on supports on only these areas. These are big parts and that means there's quite a few hours of printing time to get everything done. On the two frame pieces, those blanked off holes will need drilling out. They're either going to be 8, 5 or 3 millimeters, And that's the only post-processing that's required. To build this, we will also need some other hardware. The first item is a hammer, and I'm using this quite small and cheap one. You can use a different one, you just might need to remix the CAD to accommodate the different size. Since we're only destructively testing 3D printed parts, we can use an inexpensive drill press vise. If you can't get this exact one where you live, this diagram will give you the dimensions you need to match the whole mounting as well as the maximum width. The next component you'll need is a geared motor. This one runs on 12 volts and it was plenty powerful for the job. If you're shopping for an equivalent, follow the link to this page, click on downloads and you'll find a PDF with all of the dimensions for you to match. You'll also need some basic electronic gear such as wires and a switch to solder to the back of the motor and you'll also need some sort of 12 volt power supply to run it from. For this build you will need six bearings in total. The exact ones you need as well as the quantities are linked on the printables page. Finally, we have nuts, bolts and washers, and again, their quantities and lengths are linked on printables. Let's build, and we're going to start with our two frame pieces, the first one being the motor side, which has three holes up the top, as well as a large recess underneath. The geared motor will enter through this large hole, with the shaft poking out, and then we'll twist to align it, and use two M3x6 bolts to secure it in place. For now, the other side of the frame just needs two of the smaller bearings pressed into either side. Next we're going to build the base of the frame, including attaching our vise. 
the three legs are identical and for two of them you need to press in a pair of M8 nuts. Then position the vise on top of these two sets of legs so the two chamfered surfaces in the corners are facing each other as shown. Now we take four M8 by 25 millimeter bolts along with a washer and put them through the openings in the vise and just get the thread started on the nuts underneath. Nothing should be tight yet. For this next part, we need to run our motor to get it turning and work out if it needs to be on the left or right hand side. And we want it turning so the hammer will swing towards the jaws of the vise. It doesn't matter which way that it's turning as you can position this part of the frame on the left or right to suit. Once you know, use some M8 by 40 bolts that should cut a thread in the frame piece. If you want something more secure, you can use longer than this and then attach a nut on the inside. Now you can introduce the third leg into the opposite corner of the frame and once again the chamfered surface faces towards the vise as seen. Now with everything sitting in its final location, we can torque down the M8 bolts to hold the vise securely in position. If everything's going well, your assembly should look like what you're seeing here, with the motor rotating as shown whether it's on the left or right hand side so that as it reaches the bottom, it's pointing to the jaws of the vise. Now let's put together the sub-assembly that swings the hammer, and these two identical parts each need a larger bearing pressed in. Each side will also need three M5 lock nuts pressed into the holes. Now we're going to place the handle of our hammer so it just clears the center bore of the bearing. To help with this, I would recommend temporarily placing a long M8 bolt through the center of the two bearings. You can then slide the handle up until it just clears and insert six M5 by 35 millimeter bolts and just get the thread to catch on the lock nuts for each. Once they're all in position, you can systematically tighten them, working back and forth until the two printed parts are firmly pressed together with no gap in between. The rubbery coating on the hammer handle should deform to allow this. Double check that the end of the handle is clear of the bolt and that everything can swing freely. From this point onwards, we want to be aware of the direction of the hammer head so it will be pointing towards the vise as the motor rotates. Now you can lay out the pieces of the pivot arm in their positions, making sure that the offset holes in the center are aligned. This is wrong and this is correct. Make sure the smaller of these two pieces will be on the side of your motor. The two spacer parts will have M8 bolts pushed into the end and now we feed through our long M8 bolts through the short arm threading on the nuts and spacers until they're most of the way on. These shouldn't be tight yet. The side with the shorter spacer will then go through the hammer clamp. We can then introduce a tool to turn the bolts and they'll cut their own thread on the larger of the two pivot arms. The minimum length of these bolts is 100 millimeters and the maximum somewhere around 130. The side with the long spacers can be as tight as you dare until all of the gaps have closed up, but the side supporting the hammer should only be tied into the point that there's a small gap either side of the hammer clamp so that everything is still free to rotate. To finish off, we need to rotate the pivot arm so that the flat on the shaft coming out of the motor aligns with the cutout on the printed part. And once it does, we simply squeeze it into position. This is designed to be quite tight so it doesn't slip under load. On the idler side, we have an M5 by 35 millimeter bolt that will cut its own thread as it's rotated into position. Let's test operation. And the very first thing that I noticed is that this motor spins too fast for this intended purpose. You could still use it this way, but I was uncomfortable with how violently the hammer was swinging around at the bottom. The hammer swinging this erratically, I think would make it harder to count the amount of impacts until the test object was broken. My quick and dirty fix was to underpower the motor with 5 volts instead of 12. There was still comfortably enough torque to lift up the hammer, but everything moved a lot more slowly and I was more pleased with this. Now that everything's working, let's put something into the vise. For accurate setup, we want to rotate the mechanism so that the hammer is in the lowest position and the pivot arm is close to vertical. This will put the head of the hammer into the striking position and allow us to correctly position our test object in the vise. The beauty of this mechanism is that the hammer will slide up vertically to clear the object before then being lifted up ready for the first strike. And because of the geometry, the hammer should strike in pretty much the same place on every occasion. And that's all thanks to the clever design by Fireball Tool where the base of the hammer is offset from the motor and we have our supporting lift arm. If you want to, you can also strike objects with the hammer coming down vertically, but you'll need to prop them up on something because the vise will be nowhere near the strike zone. Like before, the hammer will slide sideways, be lifted up, and then come down in pretty much the same spot each time. Let's put in something that will break and count the amount of strikes with a wooden pencil. The first blow definitely damages it, but it's still holding together. 
However, the second blow proves too much and the pencil fails. And that's how the first mode of operation works. Count the amount of strikes until failure and then use that to determine weak points or the best material or whatever you're after. To add more value, I've designed a second mode of operation. You've already seen the parts for the base design, but here are the additional parts for the sheer strength testing add-on. To use this, we need to position the pivot arms vertically with the hammer at the bottom. And we don't need the motor. In fact, I would recommend unplugging it to avoid any potential damage. There's five new parts for this add-on and I'd recommend doing the angle dial in a brighter color. And we're gonna start by bolting that to the base on either side using some M5 by 12 millimeter bolts. Once again, these will cut their own thread the first time you insert them. Each of the swivel arms will have a smaller bearing pressed inside and then we wanna point the arrows on the base of them facing up in the orientation you see here. For each arm, we have an M5 by 16 millimeter bolt with a washer either side of the bearing which will then be inserted into the base, once again cutting its own thread. And we'll do exactly the same thing, making sure the arrow is facing up for the alternate side. Finally, we take the swivel bar and make sure the pointier side is again facing up and slide it through the cutouts in the swivel arm, through the cutout in the angle dial, and then through the cutout in the opposite swivel arm. A dab of super glue can be used to hold this in place if required. This subassembly is going to be bolted to the frame on the side with the face of the hammer. You can then use M5 by 20 millimeter bolts to attach the new subassembly to the existing frame. Four is the minimum, but you can go up to six bolts. Let's see how this version works. We lift up the hammer and then gently release it and we'll notice that the bar will be pushed by the hammer, ratcheting along and getting caught at the highest position in the angle dial. It's good to measure a baseline with nothing in the vise like you're seeing here. To reset the angle measurement, we just push in to flex the bar and rotate it back to the base. Let's test what happens if we now put something in the vise that's going to use up some of the hammer's energy as it swings through. This piece is TPU, but it still slows down the hammer on its way through. This photo was our baseline measurement, and here is one comparing with the TPU in place. So let's run the test one more time with a thin PLA piece that should still flex and take some energy as the hammer clouts it on the way through. We can see that this item was a lot stiffer because the hammer travels nowhere near as far on its follow through. Ideally, you'll use this mode of operation to destructively test shear strength, as I'm about to demonstrate with these single wall hollow rectangular prisms. With any luck, the hammer will snap the test piece as it collides. And here I'm going to compare each thickness. We have the baseline, that means the hammer swinging freely, the thinnest item, one millimeter thick, the next test piece, two millimeters thick, pretty much no change. The same goes for three millimeters thick and then a noticeable step for our strongest four millimeter version. Ideally, you'd run multiples of each thickness to average out the results. But even with this simplified test, I hope you can see how the principle works. As I mentioned earlier, there's a few things I'm curious about. So expect to see me using this machine in a future video for some testing. If you are wanting to make one of your own, everything you need is linked below on printables. I'd also like to note that just like the original on Fireball tool, you can add more weight to the hammer if you need some more oomph, and this is a modification I'll probably be doing next. Thanks to Fireball tool for inspiring this design. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy destructive part testing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.